Welcome into the Cubs Talk Podcast, brought to you by Tasty Works with Tim Stebbins, Gordon Wittenmeyer, our Cubs insiders. I'm David Kaplan. Tony Gill is at the controls. Okay, we've got a lot to discuss. I keep preaching to people, friends of mine who are Cubs fans. I ain't watching. They're not very good, but I check in occasionally. There are things to watch. You've written about it. You've written yeah, about it. We're not it. watching now. They're on right now. We're not watching them. Well, because we're doing our podcast. Oh, you're breaking <laughs> the magic of the podcast. But there Gordon. are Fourth things wall. to watch. Yeah. Like, I keep looking. Oh, Nico Horner had three more hits. Oh, Madrigal had a couple of hits. Oh, we got pitching out of Steele and Keegan Thompson and all of that. And now Nico Horner, Tim, just came out and said, the last two months are very important to show people we are closer to to being a competitive franchise that people realize. You agree? And he said, I mean, read, the, read the quote, would you, Tim? Yeah, this was I to you, right? To, yeah, he said it to me. I yeah. forgot. What did he say? He said, the baseball we have is incredibly meaningful for guys on an individual level, as well as creating momentum into next year and proving that we are closer to winning than people realize and giving an accurate look for free agents to look at. There, right there. There's one more, though. I think all of that is incredibly important, and it's all closely related, and it doesn't have to be years and years in these situations. And, and he just sort of slipped in there, showing free agents what we are and how close we are, and maybe, by insinuation, the difference that one or two of them could make. And we've been talking about that for weeks. So I agree with him. I think all of that is is in play. Uh, deeper into that conversation, he gave – Plenty of examples, and you know we've talked about it. Steele and Keegan Thompson, what they're doing is part of suggesting that they might be closer than a lot of people think. Um, but maybe better going forward than their record has been to this to this point uh, this year. And getting you know Stroman healthy. Stroman's been sidelined, and, and you know he had, he had COVID, he had a shoulder thing. Um, he's looked good since he's been back. Mm-hmm. So these kinds of things. The pitching is huge, and if you've got a foundation of pitching in place. Now you're now you can start talking about a piece or two away, and uh, so you know, do they go get one of those shortstops? Well, it's also like we talk about 2014 all the time in the second half. I got it right here, 33 and 35. That's that's not a winning record. That doesn't scream like in that season they finished with like 73 wins, right? But then I feel like that was important to show guys like Lester, right? You know, Lester mm-hmm. on the open market. And he has the relationship with the front office back then. But I don't. I think if you're going uh you're coming off a 60 win season and you went like 20 and what's like 50 or something in the second half. My math's probably off there. I, don't, I think that changes the dynamic for somebody like John Lester. I'm not saying that this winter they have to go out and get the next version of John Lester and all that meant to them, but someone who's a big caliber free agent these last two months, you, you want to build that momentum as Nico's saying. Yeah, no doubt. In 2014 was also the year that Rizzo said at the end of that year, we're coming next year. Yeah. He says every game we're playing down the stretch, people get on first base and they tell me, they can't believe how good we are, and that and I and I'm I'm thinking, what are you smoking? And they and, were seventy three and eighty nine that year. Yeah, but the second half, they were really good. Right, well, they were better. I mean, some of the pieces were coming into play. Remember, that's when Kyle Hendricks debuted, for instance, and you know, and, and some of these other uh, players, young players like Rizzo, were finishing strong. But none of it happens, obviously, without Lester and and maybe Joe Madden coming in right when they did two and that first big free agent they got that that lester contract that gave credibility to everything else you like know. said we're open for business again no doubt and, and 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 that guy in particular who they knew really well so so it all of it kind of it was a perfect storm in their favor that winter um and, and then we saw what happened with 97 wins the next year but uh yes the, the this potentially I mean, it could be 2013 all over again, right? Where where they're still a year of last place away or flirting with last place away. Or it could be 2014 if the pieces all fall right and if they're legit, you know, if they go in and get that legit frontline starter and a legit bat, presumably in the middle infield. Yeah, I mean, uh, I wrote about the farm system depth this week. It's really interesting if you look at, like the big four, we'll say, or big five maybe for farm system evaluators. It's Pipeline, Baseball America, Fangraphs, Prospectus, ESPN, like those. Um, probably missing one, but wide-ranging rankings for the Cubs system right now. Like Fangraphs has it fourth. I think Pipeline 
what I've talked about. Their system? Fourth? Yes. Minor. Yeah. So they moved them all the way up after the trade deadline. That is a massive jump. But the, the so like you're saying, Baseball America has them 16th. I think I heard on MLB Pipeline's podcast, they haven't released a, like an article on this yet, but they said the Cubs are ninth, which is what we've been kind of talking about. Yeah, that 10 to 20 range. Borderline, 10 to top 15 10. range. But I wrote about the system in these new rankings this week, and it's like the Cubs overall top 30, and what stands out is the depth. But even Jed Hoyer said it. It's like they don't have any prospect in that top 25 range, but you know a lot of players are coming, and I would think out of all this depth they've built up, you're going to get quality big leaguers out of all these guys. You're going to get at least some. It's whether some can you know then develop into that next step, that, that big-name star. Yeah, Ozzie Gein was asking the other day. He, he has friends who know this kid, I believe, from Columbia that is in the system in AAA. Dennis Correa, who I, be- who I believe is yeah. a closer there, and they believe he's got a real chance. Ozzy said, look, I've never watched him pitch, but he goes, people that I trust in Latin America said that kid's going to be a really good major leaguer. You know, what's interesting is this Matt Mervis guy who's just hit everywhere. He started everywhere. out in, in high A this year. He's at AAA right now, and he's hitting everywhere. He's also a two-way player. He's like a sneaky two-way player. They haven't used him that way. They haven't used him on the mound in the minors since he's been here. But he pitched in the Cape Cod League before uh, his draft year. Now, he didn't get drafted because his draft year was 2020, and they only had five rounds. So who knows? Would he have been a top-10 round pick? He may well have been. Um, Cubs said they targeted him in the third to five range, for what it's worth. So, and they got so, him after five. <laughs> so, you know, Jeff Samarja was, what, a six-round pick, mm-hmm. I, I think. And, and then there was all kinds of reasons behind it. Because him. everyone believed he was Football, unsignable. And, and, then they, and then they gave him the four-year major league deal. Um, but uh, this guy could have been a six-round pick. That I mean, that's a legitimate dude, and he's performing right now. So that'd be interesting. To, it's just, he's, a, he's another intriguing guy to watch who's maybe not on a lot of people's radar the way Pete Crow Armstrong is, for instance, or Brennan Davis has been. So um, they do have some intriguing people. But as much as anything, to your point, Tim, yeah, some of these guys could come in and be players for them. And and and, and the, the, the important part is that you have multiple guys like that who can come in and maybe backfill and be competitive. They don't have to be all-stars if you've already got foundational pieces in place. You've got the money and the resources to be that team that goes out and gets a frontline starter for the front of that rotation and go, goes and gets a big established bat for the order, and now these other guys can come in and supplement, and then the other guys can be pieces that you trade. I don't know if you found the Danny Correa numbers, but I think they're pretty impressive. Yeah, uh, 28 appearances. He's uh, with Iowa, but he started with Tennessee. He just got to Iowa, so I'm, the numbers with Iowa I won't go over. But overall, it's a 302 ERA and 43 strikeouts in 41 innings. So, yeah, I mean, I mean that's, that's... Throws 99. There you go. Like, I mean, look, man, the Scott Efros trade, like I've said it here before. I was shocked by that in the moment, but it they talked about it and we can see it. That was their best trade this year. Best trade. And we could see it too. Like, that's obviously a signal that, hey, man, we know we can develop impact relievers. And like, this is a guy that a lot of, go, or you can go out and buy a few for one and two year contracts. Sure. And, and you can find middle relievers. Scott Efros is 28 years old. Yeah. It clicked. No doubt. You got a 24-year-old starter that might impact your rotation. He, yeah. he it's a lot more innings than Efros yeah. will give you. And and like this guy, they they have a lot of guys like this. Like I, Correa is someone that I'm sure a lot of like there's there's prospect heads, guys who are really into that. Who he's probably been on their radar, but he's someone that they've got a lot of guys like this that are on the cusp for the bullpen that could help out, right? So that's why that Efros trade made all the sense in the world because this is another example of this guy who's right on the verge and they got a lot of guys like this to help the bullpen in, uh, next year, even maybe next month. Who knows? You know, you know what I want to know is if they go out and do some of this stuff, I want to know that going forward, if they go out and if they're able to win 85 games next year because they put something together, maybe they get into the playoff field. Who knows what happens in October when you get there? But, you know, they, they won't necessarily have those – core four or whatever they called those guys when they were coming through the system. And, and they, you know, they may not have the guy on the six or eight year contract who's just locked in. Um, but will they sustain the next time around? Are they building something? Is, is the plan in place? We all know you can, you can build a plan for a few years to put something together, but sustaining it was again, one of their issues. Um, we can go into why guys didn't sign contracts or whether they went hard enough at him and then the pandemic came along and all that. 
But will they have, will, will the upcoming plan be a sustainable one, a more sustainable one? It'll be really interesting to see because the game is changing a lot right now. The game is changing dramatically. And I don't know where that starter is coming from in free agency. It's not a I love Carlos Rodon. class. I, I, Carlos Rodon. I love Carlos Rodon if you trust that he can stay healthy for whatever the That's length of the, the big contract question. is that you give That's him. That's the big question. He's a left-hander. He's got power. He can be dominant. I, I love just his demeanor. Um, he's a really smart guy. He loves Chicago. He'd be motivated to be here, and he would slot perfectly right in the front end of that rotation, and he's a nice s- sort of uh, uh, versatile. I mean, he, he, gives a, he gives a rotation a more versatile look. you got Does, all kinds of different looks in there now. Adrian Sampson has thrown the ball pretty well this year. He struck out five of the first six Orioles today. He's got a place in this, I think. It's headed to the bottom of the third. It's no score. He hasn't given up a hit yet. He struck out five of the first six hitters he's faced. Do we kind of discount him while we got Steele and Thompson? Does Adrian Sampson have a role at all in this team? I think some people discount him, and I don't understand it because every time he goes out there, he's throwing five, six innings, quality yes, start. Yes, you understand it. It's because he hasn't done jack since he got to the Cubs. Well, I'm just, in, until he got to the Cubs. That's why. That's all I'm looking at. People, I, I'm saying even with what he's doing on the Cubs, people are still discounting it because, oh, he's Adrian Sampson, but I'm like, they Adrian, don't trust that it'll last. But Adrian Sampson on the Cubs, all he's showing is that it'll last. What he did last year and then this year, and, and every time he takes the ball, he's giving them chances to win. I don't think you can ask more from a starting pitcher. I'm not saying he's going to be Jay Carrietta and become your Cy Young winner ace, but look, man, I don't I don't know how... He might most, be become your Mike Montgomery. Yeah, I, that's, a good, that's a really good comment because I was going to say, I don't know how he would fit into the rotation next year, assuming they get somebody in free agency, you have... Three guys, four with Hendricks, holdovers, and I'm probably missing someone. So I think Smiley is a mutual option. And then you got young arms. I don't know how he would fit in that, but I w- I'm not getting rid of this guy because every no chance something might have clicked here. And I think something did click here since he got here. He said he said that much. He got in their system, and they did a couple things with his delivery and his and his pitches, and it's clicked. He said it's been different than any other place he's been. So I do think that maybe speaks to something they're putting together, something they have put together with their pitching infrastructure now. Maybe that's what we've seen. It's certainly what we've seen with Efros, right? Brandon Hughes, right? And and maybe it's part of what we've seen with Steele and Thompson as they've uh, matured and come along. I'm looking for the starters for 2023 free agency. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't think they're going to sign a free agent first baseman. I think they would just move wisdom over there. Yeah, for sure. They got a couple options there. Uh, In terms of shortstops, we've already talked about that. There's a club option on Tim Anderson, so he won't hit the market. Uh, Xander Bogarts will opt out. He has three and sixty left on his deal. I think I think that's the more likely guy. I think that's the most likely guy. I talked to I talked to all three of them. (laughs) You talked this year. Yeah, all three of the big shortstops about the Cubs. Carlos Correa, I talked to him last year. I talked to him again this year when he came into town to play the White Sox. He didn't want to be part of a rebuilding, and he has since, you know, he got that short-term deal with the idea of opting out. He can opt out after this year or next year, and he's got Scott Boris as, a, as an agent now. So I think he's looking for a, one of those milestone contract years or AAV, and I don't think the Cubs are in that market. I don't think, honestly, I'm not sure they should be. And, I, and that's not what I said last year about Correa. Uh, I loved the idea of him on a long-term contract as a foundational piece for this team because of where he was in his career. I'm not sure with what he'll ask now going forward if, if that's as good a fit. I know they like Bogarts. I talked I talk to him. I talked to Trey Turner. Uh, this week. This week up in Milwaukee when the Dodgers were up there. That's why we love Gordon. Makes Dodgers are in Milwaukee. I got a story up there. I'm going to go to Milwaukee and talk to the free agent. I'm, <laughs> I call it my ongoing series of who wants to be a Cub. And I've talked to like, what, seven guys Probably the last them. couple of years, yeah. um, including your guy for you, Aaron Judge. Aaron Judge, the but, pizza uh, king of Chicago. He I, comes here. My take on Trey Turner is he would absolutely listen. He said it's, quote, mandatory that – he get the Cubs' vision and their perceived timeline, and he would want to know all those details. Of course, that's kind of what Bogart said. 
judge I'm talked about right? that. That's what. That's uh, Carlos Correa said the same thing. Carlos Correa got that last winter when when they when they touched base. So yeah, you would think that's obvious, right? Um, but the, the 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 problem with it is is that they haven't told us what it is. They haven't told <laughs> they haven't told the paying customer what it is, and uh, and and all we're doing is guesswork on it right now. But they have said they're going to be aggressive and spend in the off season, and that becomes a, a an important issue, maybe even an urgent issue in the context of all this. But I do think. The Dodgers don't have a shortstop coming through their system right now that's ready. They don't, you know, their backup plan right now would be Gavin Lux, who's, you know, doesn't really have the glove to be an everyday uh, big league shortstop. So they're going to be front and, and center. And if Trey Turner got overpaid and someone stole him, not named the Cubs, then the Dodgers would just say, all right, we'll go get Bogarts. We'll go get right. They'll do whatever right. they want because they're willing I, to win – is now in terms of starting pitchers for next year, there isn't a ton here. A name that's intriguing if he's healthy is Jamison Tyone. Yeah, I yeah. That. yeah. He yeah. is 31 years of age right now. Uh, Luis Severino has a club option at 15 he, he million, which I don't think healthy. they would pick up. So he might hit the market, but he hasn't been able to stay healthy. Sean Manaya. Uh, I Sean love Sean Manaya. Manaya. He's from Valpo. He's had a bad year, though. He has not had a good year. Um, there's not a ton that you go, oh my goodness, we have to sign that guy. There's like no John Lester, unless you want to say Jacob DeGrom, and we talked about that earlier this week. There's... He's 35 years old with a health history that was just Jacob DeGrom. Still uh, the health the health thing is, is scary as hell. Right. There's yeah. no like one, like John Lester seemed like the obvious target going to that offseason for the Cubs. And like what you're saying, there's a lot of good arms here, but there's not one clear cut top of the rotation guy. Sonny Gray intrigue you? Kind of, but he's not, mm. not on that John Lester level, how much that means. I sense. like Carlos Rodon, man. What he's done these last two years, I, I, I love him on a, well, again, you know, I, I want to see the medicals, but he's backed up what he did last year this year he stayed healthy um he'd also have to opt out right does he have a second oh, he's gonna opt out for sure no question yeah. and, and uh, so now you're looking at probably what were the benchmarks last year robbie ray and gossman for five and one five and one ten five and one fifteen um so he might be what five and one twenty one one twenty five i don't know if i'd go five years on road down i don't know if i'd do it okay well then then who are you who are you going? Are you going five years on any of those guys? Probably not. Okay, so who's going to take three? And Rodon's tied for MLB lead and starts. So five years would scare the living. Who's going to the Jesus? Who out of me. that's good on that list is going to take less. That's what happens when you get into the free agent market. The guys at the top are going to get that extra year or two that you wouldn't like to give them. Is Tyler Anderson from the Pirates in the years past interest anybody? He's got a sub three. See, see that's the, what we're talking about, right? The Dodgers. That, that's where we're going with this, and that's what makes you wonder. Well, where the hell are they going to be next year? Go yeah. ahead and go ahead, go big, go big. It you would got, scare you, the hell out of me to give him. Okay, five let's, years. let's make say, a trade. Let's say uh, do what the Padres did and go take someone's contract. So listen, your your, your big market, your your big market club, and you're way under the luxury tax threshold. And you don't have massive arbitration guys coming up. Go out and get your bat. And give him extra years. Go get Bogarts five years. He might he might need six. I don't know. He's thirty. Give give him give him that. I know they like him. Um, and go give Rodon five. And now here's so here's what happens, right? So now you you trust Rodon for a couple of years. Mm-hmm. So now you're much better next year. You're way better next year. You go out, you get off to a hot start. You're at least battling Milwaukee or St. Louis for the lead in the division uh, into the all-star break. You're, you're looking at adding at the deadline. You've got pieces in your system now where you can do that. And meanwhile, some of those guys in the system are, don't, don't have to be rushed to the majors. They don't have to learn at the majors. And then so that when, and when they do get there, they're at the back end of the rotation. They're not in the middle of it. And so now maybe by year three of that Rodon contract, you've got a Wisniewski establishing himself 
or somebody else who we haven't even talked about. Maybe Jordan Wicks is, is around by then. Maybe Ryan Jensen is rebounding from this year and, and looking real good again. You've got a handful of guys that even if you trade a few, somebody comes through because now you think you can develop homegrown starting pitching. There's some, you know, middle 30s guys. So, Chris Bassett's always been a third solid year, Fourth arm, year, fifth year of Rodon's contract. What if some other guys are just stepping up and he's becoming what sort of, I hate to say it, but like what Kyle Hendricks is at the end of his contract. Yeah, or now, Lance Lynn. He's so, Lance Lynn. Yeah, so now he's more toward, now he's evolving toward the back end of the rotation, or he's a guy that, that goes on the IL here and there, and then when you get him back, he's great, and but. You know, you need more depth because he's maybe he's an injury risk or something at some point in that contract. But you went and got him because you're the team that can do it. You're great on the front end of that deal, and you believe in your system on the back end of that deal. That's that to me sounds like a plan, doesn't it? It does. Half like, of their uh, top fourteen prospects are starting pitchers, or in their current molds, they're starting pitchers. Obviously, guys. Well, the kid you just got from Philly. Yep, Ben Brown. Wes Neske, Caleb Killian. Mm-hmm. Braylon Marquez is probably still on someone's list somewhere. He's not on. Uh, he's not even on Pipeline's top thirty anymore. He, wanted, he, he Pipeline updated this this week. I, I won't go through all the everybody, but the pitchers. Cade Horton is number four. He's the Cubs' top pitching prospect. Just Pipeline. got drafted. Just drafted. And he mm-hmm. pitched one real full season after Tommy John his freshman year. Jordan yeah, really, and and, and it, what, Jordan, one good month. Yeah, yeah, Jordan Wicks is on there. He's five. Ryan Jensen's on there. Well, let's Jensen's wait on there. Ben Brown is seven. Jackson Ferris, your twenty twenty two uh, second round pick, is eighth. Wisniewski's twelve. DJ Hers thirteen. Killian was four in March. He's fourteen now. Daniel Palencia is nineteenth. They got him for Andrew Chapin, I believe. Porter Hodge twenty two, who's had a good year between the high A and low A. Nazir Moulet, the two way guy, who's a fourth round pick this year, is twenty three. Luis Devers, 26. He's had a good high A, low A year. 27, Luke Little, same thing. Jensen's 28th. Cole Franklin's 29. Drew Gray is 30, and he's had Tommy John this year. I think he was their second rounder last year. There's a lot there. There's a lot of depth there. A lot of depth. And that's what they've said. Like, you got you to gotta attack. It's what they didn't do, frankly, in the last contention cycle where you loaded up pitching and just you get as much as you can. You get that volume, as, the, as they say now. And you're talking about, you know, in a couple years after you get – assuming they get one of these starters, someone's going to have to pan out. You're going to have so many options to trickle up. That's what went wrong last time. They didn't have any of that. Yeah. They had nothing. And this time they're going to have an well, abundance of they it. They had to keep buying pitching. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And now they're going to have too much, which is a great thing. There's no such thing as too much pitching. I'll, I'll, I'll make, I, I'm going to make a case right now. You know, Everybody says that, that uh, uh, Jason Hayward's contract's the worst contract on their books. And, and it is now, right? It, it is now. And it's going to be dead money that they eat in the offseason for the last year of that contract. But the worst contract during that period from, let's, let's just say from the end of 2014 to 20, the end of 2020, right? Let me see if I can guess this. A hot take's coming in, I feel This it. is a hot take. Uh, let me see if <laughs> I can The worst get... contract <laughs> they signed in that frame. Other than Hayward. Yeah. And, 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 and take... You know, get off of just the sheer volume of it and just think about what it did to him. Yeah, Brandon Morrow was a horrible contract. And Tyler was, Chatwood. Tyler Chatwood's the worst contract, contract because of this. Because they got nothing out of Tyler Chatwood. They paid him for three years to be a starter. $39 million for three. And they got nothing. They got part of a season in the bullpen out of him that was productive at all. Because of that, that season, they had to. They, that was 2018. They were still chasing, getting back to the NLCS and the World Series. So they go get uh, Cole Hamels, and uh, then because they got nothing out of anybody else, they had to pick up his 20 million dollar option at the end of that year and trade Drew Smiley and trade Drew Smiley at the back end Correct. of his of his deal of his eight million dollar and deal. Take a look. At, was that the year they who did they who was their clubhouse presence guy that well, they got. Stella. They traded with Stella, right? For they, they got rid of him. Uh, Descalzo was the guy they had. That's like so all they had. when you winter. look at the domino effect of what it did to their, uh, to where they were in, in, their, in their payroll and what it did to them as a domino effect, the worst contract 
in that period was Tyler Chatwoods. That so that that's my a lot take of money on, and got and, very and that little goes back to what Tim was talking about when he was rattling off all those names. <laughs> even if that's not depth, even if that's flyers, that's a long list of flyers. One of those is going to pay. One up. or two come in, that's my point. and that's more than they got for a decade. Well said. Which all right, guys. Crazy. Wait. Shortstop is what they got to get if when they go get a bat. Yes. I have no problem getting a shortstop. If Aaron freaking Judge says I want to be a Chicago Cub and he's 30 freaking years old, you sign him. Is he the new home run king if he passes Maris's mark? Or do we think he has to pass the Bonds <laughs> McGuire? No, mark? Bonds is a crook. Oh. <laughs> but but Hank Aaron is the all time home run champion. Oh, yeah. I'm, oh, I meant Barry Bonds season. cheated. Single season, sorry. Barry Bonds cheated. Okay. So. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. If Aaron Judge passes Roger Maris's mark, does does that how does that is that going to be a discussion? You think? In a good yeah, way, I'm saying for Judge. Yeah, I'll certainly make it one. That'd be interesting. Yeah. So we we we've talked about Nico Horner and how good he's been this year, and the metrics love him defensively and the whole thing. And so you think, well, why, why do they need a shortstop? And we we talked about this before we started the podcast today. It's because we think there's going to be no shifts allowed next year, correct? Or, or no extreme shifts allowed next correct. year. And when Better we, have range. And when we look at, you know, Patrick Wisdom's stood at the shortstop spot, you know, a ton of times this year. You know, Nico's played on the right side of the bag as often, it seems, as the left side with all the shifts. Next year, you have to have legit range. Next year is the year they miss having Javi Baez in the field. No question. He made a play yesterday against the Guardians. The throw to the plate. It was the, he's the only guy in the game that could have made that play and got the out. Yeah, and and so that's why you're going to see them go get one of these guys. It'll be a shortstop, it, it, or probably at least, right, or be in on it, be in deep on that shortstop market because you you have to. Yeah, it'll it, probably be Xander Bogart too. I, I th- I'm okay. That's with my that. that's that's my guess. That's that's yeah. You guys have a great day. That is a wrap for this edition of the Cubs Talk Podcast. Brought to you by Tasty Works. Tony Gill at the controls. Tim Stebbins, Gordon Wittenmeyer. I'm David Kaplan. We'll see you next time right here on the Cubs Talk Podcast.